All right, my <laughs> next show. <laughs> Dear, oh dear. Fantastic. Because obviously it goes out on a podcast. I'll just describe to the uh, listeners. We've got Paul Stansfield on. There's a massive big light above his head. Thankfully, he's got a cap on. But he's got the biggest face mask in the world. COVID-19 can transfer between various... Of- Zoom. Uh, great look, Stanley. Great look. <laughs> How you doing? Right, Paul. Yeah, good. Stru- struggling to get an haircut, Jess. But you know how it is. Oh, you are, I am. All right. I thought you'd shave yours. No, no, good barbers. Has it permed? Has it permed? Streaks. We're we're really enjoying it because it's it's almost replacing being stood at the end of the bar at half past ten on a Sunday night telling the same stories we told the week before. Welcome to podcast number eight of Housecast. It's good to be with you again. We're very excited to have tonight's guest. Uh, we've got the usual regulars in tonight with uh, our 2005 championship winning captain, Joe Benaducci, uh, and oh. our most successful bowler of the modern era, uh, the legend that is Jez Hope. How's everybody getting on? Uh, anything to update us on, anybody? Go on, don't you go first. Uh, no, I haven't been up to much, Joe, since, uh, since we last spoke. I've uh, tried a new smoothie recipe. Oh, yeah. I got it off Neil Diamond. All right. It's got, it's got swede, carrot, lime in it. <laughs> but that's it, really. Joe Martin, I've um, I've started getting a load of pallets in. I'm taking them to bits now and they're making some bird nests and bird tables and things like that. We've got a dart board today, so I'm playing a bit of darts. Other than that, very much the same. Very much the same, thank you. Excellent. I'm hosting this uh, the podcast tonight as uh, Joe Martin, uh, current wicketkeeper and, uh, well, of a fashion, I guess. <laughs> right, so uh, we'll get on to our guest now. So our guest this evening is someone who's represented the club in many different roles, uh, whether that was as a player, the second team captain, the first team manager during the most successful period, or more recently being Charlie's second in command when building the bonfire. Paul Stansfield, welcome to Housecast. Hello, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you getting on in the lockdown? Like I said earlier, struggling to get an air cut, Joe. <laughs> hey, hey, Joe, you okay? I'm all right, mate. Yeah. Looks like supermarkets are still open. <laughs> looking at looking at Joe's face, full that screen, doesn't it? <laughs> <sighs> Come on, Joe, get on. Excellent, mate. right? So, so Paul, we'll start with uh, how you became involved at the club, kind of what age you started, and uh, the kind of time period we're talking about. So, the floor is yours to begin with. Well, I've, I've only, I'll be honest with you, I've only listened to a couple of these so far, so I don't, I don't really know what you expect. But it, does it go along the lines of, of stands where it's, uh, it's sort of said that parents, any parents, any juniors listening, uh, we did balloon about. Stan was <laughs> probably one of the worst culprits. He was often late, and when he faced Roger Harper, it was like watching a tortoise on sleeping tablets. <laughs> Good description. Right. Good descriptions. Anyone who were there will just about be waking up. <laughs> It's good as that, Paul, but he did actually ask you when you, how you arrived at the club, but can you tell us like your first time? Well, my mum gave birth to me, a bit, honestly, baby in arms at the club. I mean, I was born in September, so on my first season, I'll have, obviously I can't remember it, but it'll have been sort of 1974, you know, a bit of How many wickets did you get that year, Jez? 18. <laughs> we're, we're Blazers testimonial, I remember that's what sticks in the mind. But, <laughs> Yeah, so I basically from a baby and uh, sort of a lot, my memories sort of start there really, uh, from being sort of five, six years old and going through the, the Bill Altier, Reg Wardle, one of the greatest people, Laura's Creek Club Rusty, you know, jazz and people like that who uh, helped me along. Cracking. So when did, when did you start actually playing cricket, maybe in junior teams or when you made, you know, whatever debut, I guess? 
Well, I, I mean, the, my first memory actually it was sort of before that uh, of the club. Jez, Jez might remember this. It, there, been, there were a large event at the club. It had been late seventies, and they had a marquee on the outfield. I don't know if you can remember, Jez. Yeah, I think um, so. I've mentioned it to Stan. Stan can remember what the event were. I can't remember what it were. The event must have passed. I mean, I, I was five years old, but the, the, it's obvious why it sticks in my memory. I went down on the Saturday and Sunday morning. And my granddad and my dad were committee men. I mean, obviously, not putting the husband on it, but anyone who knows me and Matthew knows that sort of his dad died when we were very young. But So my dad was still alive. So it'd been about 1979, this, and uh, they'd had this event at the club, and there was a, a marquee up on the outfield. And on the, the day after the event, went down with my dad and my granddad to take this marquee down. And uh, as a five year old, I was playing on the outfield. As we were taking the marquee down, one of the guys, let go of one of the pole, one of the scaffolding poles, 15 foot scaffolding pole, and it fell down, sort of timber effect, and it me flush on the head. So <laughs> bounced back up off my head, come back down and hit me again on the head. So <laughs> this, this thing's like, at this point, hammering me into ground like a nail, and someone comes and rescues me. So I, I can't remember who, and then they wish me off to club ice, but I was still conscious but screaming. Just it just of them days, like so I was sort of given an out today bag of Chris and told to stop being so fucking soft by Jack Hayes. <laughs> and that, you know, that's me, that is my genuine first memory of Lawrence Cricket Club. Welcome to Stories with Stan. Dear Diary, 1993, first game of the season versus Church. Match abandoned by 2.30. Ground under a sea of water. Cards begun and abandoned by 4.30. Table under a sea of ill. <laughs> Played cards with Roger Bromley as partner against Peter Gayblade and Rusty. We're playing dumb. I played crap. Little did I realise that I would continue this form into the season with the bat. <laughs> Mick Ellis had a good fundraising scheme under his belt, the Lawhouse Ripoff Enterprises production. This involved running a sweep in the Villa versus City and Arsenal versus Sheffield Wednesday game. First player to score. I drew the reserve goalkeeper in each team. Lucky Heaton rides again. I don't know why, I just don't pay my wage direct into Lawhouse Cricket Club. Church game hastily rearranged. High hopes of beating Church. Matthews looked overweight and anybody who thinks he has to impress by eating his polystyrene pie tray before the game must be doubtful. But that's what he did. Anyway, they batted first and debut boy Paul Webb, six foot tall, 16 stone Fred Scuttle lookalike for those that can't remember him, and slimline debutant in those days, Matt Hope, bowled well. This wasn't Matt's first game, but it was his first game as a slimster. 134 didn't seem a lot to get with our now formidable batting lineup. But our early thoughts about Matthews proved incorrect. Of the three balls I faced, the first one I draw with my thumb to first slip, the second one whizzed embarrassingly past without me moving, and the third one ate through my guard like a polystyrene pie tray. There can be no more depressing feeling than letting the side down. Having played for 24 years, you would have thought that I would be used to it by now, but I'm not. We suffered badly and were all out for 84. A couple of bright spots. Matt Hope battered and bore well. He was hit on the forehead from a Matthews lifter and the game was held up for a few minutes whilst the ball received treatment. <laughs> Paul Webb also bowled well. And last but not least, veteran-looking Chris Scott defied most cricket pundits' opinions by putting a useful 17 on including a straight six. This is only the second six that Chris has ever hit, and if he talks about it as long as the first six, it should seem through to the next century. For those that don't know, Chris's other six was in 1985, when he hit Eric Simmons, the professional for Nelson, over point for six into the embankment at Nelson, or as Scotty tells it, over the motorway. This was a very disappointing start. We are a much better batting side than this. Two yeah. heavy blows to the head as a five-year-old. I mean, that's, that yeah. explains a lot, doesn't it, it, really? It, it, if, I hadn't <laughs> been, if I hadn't been dragged away, like I said, I'd have been hammered into the ground like a nail, I think, by that beam. <laughs> Cracker, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's funny that you remember that, Stanley. And like you say, it's, uh, it's probably typical of things that ha happen at Lower House. And, you know, were then, were they? Not now. No, no, no. 
meant to them. For any, for any parents or juniors who might be listening. <laughs> yeah, please use the cream. But yeah, remember your granddad and yeah, I mean I can't remember what that that occasion was, but I can you know I can you know I can see that it was there. I remember it being there. No, it's uh, great memories, and you're only five then, Stanley. Yeah, five or six. Yeah. What what was it, Paul? What was the event? Can you remember? Did you say Stan could remember Stan, it? I've asked Stan knows that tell about that scaffolding Paul landed on my head, and he ta- he can't Stan can remember what the what the event was. It, it was late seventies, but I I I, I can't honestly. God, he's told me, but I can't remember. But yeah. obviously, I can remember. I can remember being smashed on head by a uh, scaffolding post. So, what was your first cricketing memory, Stanny? First cricketing memory. Well, Bill Holt Wednesday nights. Uh, Wednesday night training sessions with Bill Holt. And my granddad used to take me to them. And y- you know, you go along, and, and Bill was like the old-fashioned cricket coach. You know, a pair of khaki pants on, Lancashire sweater. He'd have a, a gang of seven year, seven and eight year olds around him and he'd be trying to tell us how to play cricket and I, 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 I would probably can't remember fully but I was like most kids you know I'd have my bat and, I'd have my bat and ball and then you'd, you'd have to go and stand in the field but one one session that we had with Bill it'll, it'll be with me for the rest of my life sort of it, it's etched, etched on my brain you'd, you'd never forget it if it happened to you but Bill had it I'd, I'd have my bat and ball and then like most seven or eight year olds I got a bit uh, a bit fed up. Your turn to go on field. It is, it is at that age. It's boring. It's fielding. So I stood at fielding. Start doing a few cartwheels, a bit of toppling, and I stopped rolling up, rolling up and down slope. Obviously, it's slope at on field. And you brought and, and Bill. To be fair to him, he just used to turn a blind eye to these things. You know, he, he, he was too busy showing people how to hold a bat and things like that. And fielders, everyone were at it basically. But then at quarter to eight. Bill used to get everyone to stand round him, and you'd stand in this big circle. Well, Bill had sort of, what have we learnt tonight, kids? And uh, it, it, it'd do a, a forward defensive and, and show, you know, and talk us through that. And then the kid next to me, this particular night, started sniffing, but like making like a sniffing noise. And I'm like, what's he doing? And then he says to me, what's that in your ear? And I'd roll <laughs> through, biggest pile of dog shit. Obviously, didn't know. <laughs> And this, this dog shit were obviously matted in the air. That's what this kid was sniffing. <laughs> now, what, obviously, <laughs> so it's, it's 100% true. This. And, and obviously, kids are, uh, kids are merciless bastards at the best of times, aren't they? And uh, I, I, were known as, uh, I were known as shitheads, seriously. <laughs> so the, kids, the, kids, the other kids called me shithead for a good while after that, you know. <laughs> It was just something, something you sort of learn to live with until, uh, until, until something happened to some, someone else. But it was pretty, uh, pretty harsh for a few weeks down there after that happened. <laughs> so your nickname was Shithead for the first couple of weeks? Yeah, yeah. I, amongst the Bill Oates amongst, 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 uh, Oates coaching, uh, the, the, uh, the kids who were coaching in them days, yeah. <coughs> shithead. Paul, were there any other names that we might know in that group of kids or not? Uh, Danny Olden, maybe. All right, uh, yeah, um, okay, yeah. Christian Duckworth, he's he's grand of a guy called Len Graham, who Jez will know. Yeah, yeah. Chris, Christian Duckworth were involved. A lad called John Nuttall, who played down there for a little bit in, as a junior. But none that really spring to mind. No. Other than okay. them three, really. No, I'm just trying to think of any of the others. Cause you, there's, you know, a photo knock, there's a photo knocking about somewhere. We're all on it, and Evan Gray's there. So whatever year Evan Gray were, it would have been around yeah. that time. Um, but that bit older, weren't you, than Matt? And... You know, Brock and the others. They, yeah, they were always, they were always, uh, Matt, Ryan, Sam, and were like two years above me at school. So when 80. I was a third year, they'd have been like a fifth year at high school. Proc's, 82, a, little 83. Bit Proc's a little bit older than the rest of us. Yeah. 82, 83, Stanley and Jez. Right. Yeah, yeah. I say, I've seen a photo knocking about it. I think Anne Cochran's got it. And Neil McSweeney might have been there. We're going to move on to senior cricket now, Stanley, unless you've got some stories about junior cricket that you want to I discuss. Just, just one with Eduardo, really. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we talked about Bill Holt, and uh, I, don't, I don't think Reg, Reg and uh, Bill actually worked together at the time. I think Bill did, like, kiddie coaching, and uh, Reg picked the junior teams. Honestly, I, I were 11. It was a bit of a surprise. It was during school holidays. I got a phone call to say, uh, can you play for under-13s? I'd, I'd have been 10, I think. Can you play for under-13s at uh, Salesbury tomorrow night? So, obviously, I had a, a bat, some pads, and uh, 
some gloves, but I needed whites. I didn't have whites because I didn't have any spikes and just just little things like that. So I told my mum what I needed. I said, Red Wardle wants me to play for under 13s. I'll need some whites, uh, spikes, and I'll need a box because we'll be playing me a, playing me an old ball, playing me a corky mum. So I'll, I'll uh, obviously I'll need a box. So mum says, all right, I'll be at school order, so I must be playing eight. And I, I got in about half past four. My granddad would pick me up at five o'clock to take me over to Salisbury. Big dozen little dozen. I got in and uh, my kit was sort of laid out upstairs. And it sounds a bit dapper, it was pretty normal in them days. It was like a white school shirt, a pair of bleached jeans, a pair of simod, white simod pumps as trainers, but that, you know, it made up whites, and I wouldn't have been the only kid like that. But next to it, there was an ice cream tub. <laughs> I thought, so I, I shouted to my mum, I says, Mum, what's, what's this ice cream tub next to me? What do I need? She said, it's that box you needed. <laughs> <laughs> So I thought, Jesus Christ, like, so I'm not only shithead, and what are they going to think when I start shoving that down my kicks before I go out to bat, you know, and I scream to. And more importantly, Stan, it wanted to ball a bit, you know, <laughs> so, so I thought, well, I can't take that. Can't. So my, my, first, my first ever knock for Laura House under the edge, it was basically when we bat in front of me bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> Might explain why I went batting went safe from then on. <laughs> So, Stan, you're obviously obviously pretty good as a junior, so, and you and you managed to get into the third team. We actually have a scorecard uh, of your first third team game, or the first third team game that we've got on record. Um, that was 1987. It's, it's yeah, Accrington. Yeah, it is. That's what we're looking at now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jesuit captain. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, we we were we were talking about this card during the week. Blaze played. He'd have been I don't know 20 at that stage playing yeah. at third eleven. It yeah. Were, it were, I mean, it, it might, you might not remember, it was actually at Burnley Holidays. The reason I, it was like, it, were, it weren't a third team, you know, if you look at it, like Blacks and Mick Higgin and Matt aren't there, it was a team that were thrown together. Right, like, okay. Like, like Burnley Holidays were on, and that's why I played, I played, I think I played two games, three games at most, one after other, then did play again for first till sort of two years later, you know. You batted at six, but didn't bowl. Yeah, I, I, no, I used to do all that with batting under 13s at the time. Used to, could hold me on. And opening the batting for us that day was Shane Higgins. Yeah, Shane's been in touch. He's a he's a podcast fan. For those that don't know, Shane lives in Minneapolis, but he uh, he's a big podcast fan. He listens to us, and he's been in touch. So hello, Shane, if you're listening. Yeah, giving um, us feedback there, Shane. I do remember that game, you know, Stan. And for some, you know, I can't remember some of the games that I played in 2004, but I remember that being um, right up the top end of the square at Ake. Yeah. And having to chase one right to the other side, it would, it would have really good memory, good good game. I remember because all you you you, <clears throat> you tell people when you go to Accrington now, they wrote the boundary off now. They never used to wrote that boundary off, did they? It used to be enormous, didn't it? From from left yeah. to right, Accrington, yeah. so enormous ground, and it, well, it's only sort of recently that we've started doing that. In the last sort of nine or ten years. So how long do you think you played in the third team for, Stanny? Well, I played. I, I, I played about 1989. To be fair, I didn't do anything of note in uh, third team. I thought I, I used to think I was better than some of the players that got a chance, but th- there were sort of reasons for that. Who's you know, I mean, these people are friends, and you know, I still I still talk to them now. But sort of, I always felt I was better than say Danny Olden, but because Brian Holmes was captain. And Lofty with first team captain Danny always used to get a bat in the ball before me, you know. So there were there were people and there were people there. I thought well, I'm, I'm I'm sort of better than him, but I never seemed to get to do, you know. All of a sudden, people like uh, Marcus G left and, and a few others, and it sort of it. I sort of went. We ain't actually ain't really doing anything in thirds. I find myself in seconds, probably not good enough, really. But uh, we just needed players. I, I finished 1990 uh, in. Second team, a guy called a, mate, a good mate of mine, Simon Crossley. We, we both sort of managed to stay in at the beginning of 1991, and uh, we had a game at the beginning of 1991 against Churchill. And a guy called Tommy George, I remember him, I remember him, absolutely smashed me all over the place. It, you know, I thought, is this the game for me? Then the week after, the, the very next week, encouraged by Roger Bromley. They were brilliant with me all the way through. Encouraged by Roger Bromley. We went to Ramsbottom. We didn't have any... We didn't... Uh, we bowlers out 
have have a people where people missing for first team people go. And I actually I actually went from that pacing off Tommy George to bowling twenty three overs from one end at Ramsbottom with Rusty as captain, and it, it sort of took off from there for me really. From that one game, I just became an established second team bowler, you know, and end, ended up having a decent season. How old you been then, Sammy? Approximately uh, seventeen. Right. And mm. obviously Keith Keith Rusty Fairclough was your, was your uh, second team captain at that point, as you just said. Yeah. Perhaps one of my favourite people in the world, Keith. I frequent, before the lockdown, I used to go and have a chat with him most, uh, <laughs> on most mornings just to see how he was getting on and whatever. But what was it like playing under Keith? I mean... <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I absolutely love Rusty. And, and, you know, you, you have people who, who sort of, you learn the game off and you get you get better off. You know, you have good captains. You know, Gary, Gary Moore, I, you know, I don't think anyone will ever beat him as a captain at Lower House. And, you know, one of my best mates, Charlie, has been the more successful captain. But Gary, with, with the tools he had to work with, he was phenomenal. But but Rusty, in, term, in, in terms of me personally, the amount of encouragement he gave me to sort of uh, to develop and get better were fantastic. Along and the other person who I don't I don't think I've told many people this, but I used to get a lot of uh, encouragement off uh, Keith Hudson, God bless him, Lindsay's dad. Yeah, all right. Yeah, he he, uh, he did a lot to help me, you know, because we were next door neighbours, and obviously, you know, we were brought up there to dad really, me and Matthew. And so and Keith Keith was always behind, us, always encouraging, always offering. He used to come and what you know, I got he, he pushed he pushed me as well. But, but you know, Rusty and Keith. But uh, I mean, Rusty for those who know him, I mean, he has. He has his ways, and that, that second team, and then days. I mean, he had his he had his hands full. We uh, not just obviously the characters in there. You know, they, they were sort of uh, Proc, Ryan, Matt, Simon, myself. You know, and others. But Rusty, he had to do absolutely everything because that that was the way of the club in them days. Um, and you know, to, not only were they picking the team, we sort of the travel out, the scores. They sometimes had to change the batting order. So we could make the teas, the Rusty, you know, and it's it well, that that's how it were. But every now and then, it just used to explode. If you know Rusty, and he even does it today, when he's praising you or he's bollocking you, he always puts an emphasis on the last word. So it's always like, "Well done, son." Or, <laughs> <laughs> when you say it, you, you, you sort of realise he does it, don't you? Yeah. And uh, you know, and if it were a bollocking, it were like, "Listen, you." You know, this is beyond the you. Obviously, amongst others, I, you know, I was one of his. Uh, I was always one of his main targets. But I got, I, you know, to be fair, I got more well done sons off him than bollockings. But but we used we used to have some classic runnings, and and one of them were uh, were playing uh, Richton seconds at home. They had a guy playing for him called Barry Hill. This 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 guy, I didn't really know him then. But apparently through the 70s and 80s, he was one of the league's top all-rounders, like Langshire League, top amateur all-rounder, this Barry Hill. And this particular day, he were, were winning Richton game. And I'd already bowled, I'd opened bowling, but he brought me back on, did Rusty. And he says to me, I need you to bowl outside Barry Hill's off stump. He says, right, fair enough. So he gives me a ball, and I'm bowling from to car park end. And the ball's at Barry Hill, and about fifth ball over, I bowled him round his legs, and it was a, it was a game clincher. I bowled him round his legs, and it was one of them, you knew they didn't have enough left. They were, if they were going to win it, Barry Hill were going to win it. So we're all in Uddle, and Rusty, which sort of last to appear in Uddle, and like he does, he pushes his glasses back up his nose, and he says to me, I'm taking you off. He said, I'm putting Derek, he said, I'm putting Derek on Derek Lana. I says, why? He said, because I told you to bowl like his fucking off stump. <laughs> <laughs> and he genuinely... It must have just been that way, I don't know, and he genuinely took me off and put somebody else on. <laughs> he was my first captain as well in the seconds. And, I, yeah. and again, you know, I love Rusty to bits. I've said this to him a million times, but when I made my debut as a kid in second level, I can't remember exactly how old I was, either 14 or 15, in a men's team, I was absolutely petrified of Rusty. Scared to death. In field, you know, it, it, just his mannerisms. There were none, none of this like molly coddling young kids like there is now. No. You went into a men's team, and you just got treated like one of the rest of them. And yeah, if you, you were, did, yeah. you know, if you if you were moving in field, they were barking orders at you. And I'd, obviously, I'd never experienced anything like that before. I was absolutely scared to death of making a mistake. But you know, you sink or swim sometimes, don't you, in them situations? But what you were saying about encouraging. 
the first time I ever remember batting in the second eleven was away, uh, a game away at Nelson, and we we were on our to nothing. We'd lost a game, chasing. We were probably about a hundred short, but. They needed, obviously, to get the last wicket to get the extra points. And I'm batting with Keith with about three overs to go. Me, me and him were 10 and 11. And we finished not out. And he, he meant walking off the field, finishing not out, just to stop them getting the bowling points. He made me feel like I'd done something yeah. remarkable. Yeah. And we got beat by 100 runs. Well, as like, as as it's absolutely the same as Joe. We're actually, now you mentioned that, we're actually me, me batting that kept me in second team. But see, I mean, it sounds daft now, but it did actually keep me in second team initially in 1990 because on my debut against Asenham, we are in a similar situation. And I, were, I ended up batting with us today. They got 240, and I think we were 120 for eight when I went in. And we put, we put about 60 on the me and Rusty, and I, I finished 25, not eight. And obviously, we got hammered. But, you know, Rusty were, like I say, he, 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 he praised you when you praise you, and he knocked you down when you need knocking down. And I suppose that, that sign of a good captain, a good motivator. But I, other things, Jez, I mean, you look, you look at it, you look at us all, sort of me, again, names again, me, Matt Ryan, Prop, all, all these guys, and, and, and again, there were others. That first team in the 90s, who'd all, all come through Rusty, you know, what, if you say what stand was now, is remarkable, but you look at that team, and it used to finish fourth, fourth mid 90s, we used to finish fourth, fourth fifth, sixth every year. Yeah. And, uh, and Rusty brought a lot of that team through. You know, a lot of us have come through Rusty into that team. Yeah. So, you know, he did a, he did a great job under the circumstances. It don't go underestimated by us who went through it, but it, it sort of forgot. I do think things like that I forgot about now. That's yeah. Like, you know, stands right. We weren't a bad team. You know, we were very, very competitive. And, and you look at some of the pros we played against and, and some of the money clubs were spending then compared to us. It was a fair achievement, and, and everyone contributed, especially when uh, Flags were pro. We were, you know, the, the workload was shared like team quite well. And, yeah, we uh, mentioned when I, I think it was the first time Stan was on, and I think that was a bit of a turning point of going from, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, early 70s, where it really was a social club that people went and play cricket and wasn't involved with the social club. And then, you know, with, with the way, such a great job Lofty did, bringing in the likes of Rusty and Tom Sullivan and Keeley and all these, getting through the late 70s, through the 80s. All of a sudden, cricket became a better standard at the club. But then late 80s, we started to amalgamate the cricket and the social side and the, I'm not saying professionalism, but, you know, we took it a little bit more serious, got backing from the committee, and I think that took us on to the 80s and 90s. And, and like you said, we've got some pros then. You know, again, Ken Smalley, a great job handing that over to, to David Wren. And getting some pros that wanted to come in, you know, change the club, change the the outlook of the players, you know. And Stan accepted that, you know, he talked about Cameron Williamson season. Now, so you're right, that, you know, people like Rusty and, and others really go unnoticed to what went on at that period. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that second team, as, it, as we were bringing us Fury, Fury it, got, it got us to a stage where we used to win, win, win more than what we lost, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Rusty, it was it a big contributor to it when he didn't have to go and make tea, you know, when he could open bat and he used to, uh, he used to get some runs, did Rusty. Another one with Rusty, and it's just, just come to me now, but he, he mentions it to me virtually every time he sees me. 1992, I think, just beyond Verge at first team, you know, it was sort of, I were close. At the end of that season, I had 49 wickets in second team. Right. It was last ball of the season at Church away, the very last ball of the season in September. A ball at Church's number 11, the game were won, a ball at Church number 11, last ball, nicks it to Rusty. And he dropped it, and it was an absolute sitter, honestly, an absolute sitter. But you know what Rust is like. It, 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 he obviously had him. He had him on him that, that day. So we're walking up, and I was disappointed. Eighteen year old could have got fifty wickets. It would have been something to talk about. And I'm a bit down in dumps about it, but it sounds a bit selfish. All of a sudden, push at specs up nose like he does. Listen, you. But here we go. He said, if you had to drop that catch at Bake up in May, that wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> <laughs> no, fucking nearly took my fucking head off, Rusty. But, yeah. <laughs> but that, you know, that's probably a lie. It, it, it didn't let you get ahead of yourself, did Rusty? And, and partly so, you know. I mean, he's still, Keith, Keith is still like that now. As I say, I, I 
out of lockdown after every game I'd go and see him on the Monday morning and we'd have a and we have the chat about what happened in the game what what we thought what we thought we could have done better what we did well and I think Keith's presence and his knowledge and also just how he talks to people and gets his point across it can be really underestimated sometimes and he's a really really valuable member of of the club and I and I and I'm really proud to call him my friend um, especially with everything that he's done Welcome to Stories with Stan. Each length's away. Match abandoned due to a cloud burst five minutes before the game was due to start and after East Lancs had spent 55 minutes mopping up in their designer mopping up gear. Pity. Still, they probably don't get their hands dirty during the week, so the experience will do them good. The one thing I've noticed after 24 years at Lawrence was the general, in fact, almost overwhelming lack of dress sense and quality attire in the team. The example was set by Skipper Jez Hope, who must have a denim farm somewhere. Usually, it's his Roy Rogers denim jacket or his Shaking Stevens old denim any mount fit. Today he had a pair of mechanics wranglers on, complete with engine oil. Let's go with a traditional furry bright cerise zip up cat suit top. Gary Moore has had a dour brown, dark brown and bottle green blouse type shirt, complete with black jeans. It was the perfect outfit to commit suicide in. The rest of the team were attired in jeans and t-shirts with matte or pad in a final touch with a big rip across the knee. It was left to the two veterans in the team to try and address the decline. I had on my blue blazer, elegant grey slacks, a die-catching tie, surplus CID gear, if the truth be known. And the veteran-looking Chris Scott had on a blue suit. It was a good effort, but it had D-Mob written all over it. The professional did not look any better. Casual sweatshirt, casual and sweaty tracksuit bottoms. Even allowing for the fact that he's Australian and has probably never had to dress up in his life, this was a bit much. <laughs> To pass the time, whilst watching the rain, I occupied myself by reading the Sunday People Lonely Hearts and Problem Letters page. One problem letter began, I have nothing to live for, I want to die. The reply began, if you want a Law House member, make yourself one, and if you are already a Law House member, no one. On the Lonely Hearts page, a number of letters seemed to be from the veteran divorcees from Salford or Bolton. I began to be convinced that Chris Scott was writing to the paper. <laughs> This appeared to be confirmed when comma omitted, the following appeared. Male white, single brown, hair, six foot tall. <laughs> it had to be Chris Scott. The only question remained, which side did he part that single brown hair? So game abandoned, Laurie Scruffs and Ratbags returned to the West End. A flea ringing in there is from me about dress sense. At the West End, the game of Don reared its ugly head. Ever loyal Bromley decided... I was an obvious bad bet after last week, so he partnered Chris Scott and I parted, partnered Peter Gainer, Peter Gainer, if rightly known. During the course of the game, it became obvious that the circulation problems that Chris Scott has had in his hands for a number of years had not desisted. He was known throughout the game as Edward Purple Hands. Sadly, the game was steeped in controversy. I scored and struggled to come to terms with the scoreboard. I try mark the wrong scores we were declared winners in the first game. Rusty and Jez Hope were our next opponents, and again, after further problems with my scoring, we were declared winners after two recounts. Words such as cheat and rogue were uttered. Rusty took over the scoring. Having led an exemplary life for 35 years, the allegations of cheating and the removal of scoring caused me some anguish. Fortunately, by dealing off the bottom of the pack and me mowing to Peter Gaynor, we managed to manipulate the game in our favour. Um, yeah. So I'm glad that I'm, I'm, I didn't I didn't know a lot of those stories. So it's really it's really nice to listen to. Well, I mean, just finish on Rusty and, and best one ever. And again, some of these things it'd be saying mad now where you play the game now, but they were they were quite normal. And again, Jez will back me up with this. But ev- everything at Lawrence in them days had a lifespan. I mean, seriously, they used to get the cocktail chevies out of ladies' glasses if they hadn't if they hadn't been damaged, and, and they used to use them again. See, we used to use cocktail chevies again. It was unbelievable. And, and, and everything had a lifespan, especially, especially cricket balls. Right? So, and, and lifespan of a ball used to be first team match ball, first team spare, second team match ball, second team spare. 
and like you, you wherever you'd be playing, you, you come back and you pick this team scorebook up, and it's say uh, like. Jezo, 246 off 23, and you think, <laughs> you think, fucking hell, next week's match ball's not going to be that much cop. But they used, to, they used to give it to Rusty. Rusty, take it home, get all concrete and glass out of it, give it to Polish. <laughs> give it to Polish, and, and then we'd use it week after. Playing, we have a double header. I'll never, never forget it. We're playing Accrington at home, and then Tom had in a way on the Sunday. We're playing against Accrington at we, we, we got a reasonable score and Neil McSweeney were balling from Park End and he had he were born at a guy called Mark Domain a big guy who used to play for Rackington good second team player good solid second team player and me and Prop were fielding at long on and long off Neil McSweeney balls this ball and Mark Domain launches it into Park into Bushes for six so next ball umpire gives Neil spare next ball same shot but further into Bushes <laughs> so Rusty shouts you two, go up for them balls. So Prox says, Rusty, we'll only, we'll only have nine men. Rusty, it don't matter. I'll worry about that. You two go and find them. But it used to be quite normal, that in second team. You'd play with ten while someone looked for ball, but he sent me and Prox. So we climbed into the park and we're rummaging around bushes looking, looking for balls. And about three or four minutes later, Neil McSweeney climbs up. <laughs> Neil McSweeney climbs It's true, is it? Neil McSweeney climbs over the wall. And he says, Stanny, Rusty's taking me off. He's putting you on at parking. So I'm like, all right. He says, I have to stay here and help him look for these balls. Or... <laughs> so, Pro- so Brock and Neil carry on looking for balls. I climb back into the ground, walk back onto the pitch, mark me run up. So I'm at the end of my run up and I'm thinking, you know, it's a tough gig this. I've got six field as a keeper. It's me and Rusty. So we'd, we'd like nine men. Brock and Neil still nowhere to be seen. All of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, Rusty's walking towards me, marching towards me with his, uh, his tank top on. And he says to me, uh, and he has the second spare in his hand. He, he, he like stands in front of me, pushes his nose, pushes his glasses up his nose again. And he puts the second spare in my hand, but he keeps hold of it. So now we've both got hold of this match ball. And he says to me, listen, you, he says, you better not... Uh, you better not lose this match ball because it's the only one I've got left. He said, in fact, if you do lose it, we won't be going to fucking Tom, but in tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and he walked off and left, and left me to it. So, Stanny, obviously, as you said, you took you nearly took 50 wickets in the second team and then broke into the first team. Do you remember your debut or? Well, I can't. I mean, I should. I, prof, I, I always felt in 1992, I should have been given my chance then. But, you know, Neil McSweeney got, got picked before me for a couple of games by Jez. And then I thought, 1993, they looked like there were a place available, but Jez rooted around Burnley Cop Shop till he come up with a guy called Paul Webb. So I got pushed back again. And the, the, this, this Paul Webb came off shop floor at police station and played a few games but then eventually Jez rang me up and said you're in at East Lanks and I made my debut at East Lanks it went alright I don't think there were any wickets or anything but I think about like four overs for 15 bowling like Dave Pearson and that which was just a different level to what I've been bowling at you know miles different pro and Dave Pearson compared to second team so that was my debut and then I, I sat out again a bit then because everyone were back Paul Webber who actually but he was a good cricketer with Paul Webb, to be fair. But he, he just wasn't he just wasn't available very often. And it would it would come it would be coming less and less available and all of a sudden he missed one one Saturday at Aslindon, they give me a game and I got three wickets and I, I sort of settled into the first team from there then. Remember who them three wickets were, Paul? Phil Simmons was definitely one of them, my first one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Blaise, good catch by Blaise. Scotty stumped someone. Yeah, Mike a, Ingham. Yeah, I'm going to say Graham knows, but yeah, marking him, yeah. And Patrick yeah. Lord, what other one? Patrick Lord, right, yeah. So not back, not three Barons there, are they? Especially Simmons and Ingham. Yeah, it, it, actually, I mean, you don't like blowing your own trumpet, but the, the day after was my, my real, uh, the real moment for me because the day after we played Nelson Home and I got a, I got a five for in a collection the very next day. And you had yeah. some how prize old, scouts in there as well. Then? Uh, 18 then. No, 19, 19, yeah, 19. So on that day, Stanny, you got um, carrots out. Paul Garrity, um, yeah. Marcus Phelan, to name a, to name a couple of those wickets. And at that, yeah. So at that point, you were obviously 
starting from established in the first team. Um, mm. Do you have any, as that sort of progressed through and you, and you made your way through the 90s, is there any um, notable performances or moments that you, that you think are important to discuss? Or? I mean, you know, the personal, the personal moments, you always know, remember your best display. I can, I can remember bowling rotten stall out at Lower House, but sometimes you can bowl, at, you can get five or six weeks and not bowl so well. But at that day, not only did everything come out right and feel right, the, the figures matched it as well. You know, yeah, and it were the yeah. best that ever bowled that day. You know, whether conditions, obviously it's a conditions game, isn't it? Bowling and uh, yeah, but it, it uh, that that one sticks in mind. What about the, this? What about this theory about you and Roger Harper? I, I mean, the, the ball that got him out at Law House was uh, it's Nigel Stockler still has it down his court and bowled that Lancashire League uh, website, which is uh, a bit disappointing, really, because I mean. You know, pitched on his leg stump and took his off bail off. It was got to be honest. I didn't do it on purpose because I don't think I could do it on purpose. You know, but it just everything went right, everything come out right, and it just did him. You know, people from Bay Cup who I got on with Dave Thompson, Pete Thompson, will talk about it, and I got him out again a few weeks later. Clean bowl, they just played all round one. But Peter Thompson always says to me, he said it with the ball, or at the time, Pete Thompson said with the ball the week before that got him yeah. out yeah. the second time. And it were, it were only a couple of weeks after he'd uh, demolished Alan Donald as well with that. Excellent. But, uh, yeah, I did, I, did, I did all right against him most times, really. I don't think he ever took me apart. I did well against a few of them. It, it don't want to come across as big-headed because my overall stats won't suggest I would get ball. But I have a, a decent record against Simmons. I had a decent record against Scuderi. You know, I didn't... I, I seem to get... Pros out and get smashed all over that shit, to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> Truth be known. What was it like playing in the 90s, Danny? Because there's lots of stories about how Lower House were, were, weren't a great team, but over these past few weeks, we've sort of established that through part of the 80s and then going into the 90s, the Lower House team were progressing quite well. So but From 95 through to 99, so you've two years with Flegs, um, a year with Curry, a year with Yabba, and a year with Motti where rules weren't brilliant and uh, the, the way we played, it didn't really, really suit us. If you look at that year, we didn't have a great year, but we, we drew a lot of games. Yeah, they played time cricket, uh, didn't they? Yeah, we, we, we drew a lot of games. We didn't lose many, but we just struggled. We just didn't have the sort of players you needed to win in that format, really. We were a decent season. We didn't, we didn't embarrass ourselves by any stretch. But yeah, I mean, that side from 95 to 90, it was a good side. We were well balanced. We were a great captain. And Fleggs were, uh, Fleggs were top pro as well. You know, he, 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 him and Gary got it going. They were brilliant at sharing the, the workload, making you feel important. How would you, how would you think Fleggs would fit in in today's setup? How do you think he'd get on? Well, it'd be, it'd be brilliant because he is, uh, you know, I think he, he admitted his sell at the level he was at. First class level, he, he had he needed to he needed to grab it. He needed to get everything out of himself to compete at that level. But he brought that attitude to our level. Now, obviously, we're a step above at our level. So his enthusiasm, I mean, his fielding was just was just something else. You know, his, his fielding was absolutely amazing. And uh, and but then he just he just every every he just got everything out of every ounce of ability he had. Which which for a guy before him. Craig Light, who almost looked like watching a Test match batsman, but just didn't didn't have the didn't seem to have the energy or the the character the drive. Yeah, yeah, the drive to uh, to achieve to, to try and get to the top where you could never accuse flags of that. Sure, or do shall I mean I'll just give you a bit of you know about uh, about flags. I mean Joe Martin, you won't remember him, will you at all? You like he it was five foot four, real real fit athlete and an ounce of pass on him trained hard in his own time got the best out of other people who wanted to to work with him he wasn't a preacher he was quite a quiet lad when you ask how, how he would go on now and I know it's a different era and Stan goes on about the different eras but you would just no one would ever feel down when he was in the team you know he was always you know little little things you'll remember this Stanley you know I was bowling a lot then Stanley was bowling all the balls he would run to the bowler at the beginning of every over and take your jumper and cap to the umpire. Yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. Where he was fielding, he would give you some words of encouragement. 
you know, you're bowling great there, keep that going. Or, look, there's a bit of a weakness there. And really get that. A little bit before it was fashionable to go and tap it out every yeah. time someone killed it. He did that every ball or you know, every over. If you're ever struggling, if you're ever struggling, if you needed any help, and you, you, you could say get down to the club on Tuesday yeah. morning, he'd be there. Yeah. You know, yeah. he'll bat and you bowl at him, or he bowl at you, you bat. And he did it for yeah. all of us, you know. Yeah. Chaps, I'm not saying it's right, but what, you know, he'd do his own little bit of research or working at opposition pros. He loved, he felt inferior to opposition pros at times, certainly big names. So he would do his research. <laughs> He's going to bat against them, work out how he's going to bowl. Because he, he used to bowl left arm Chinaman a lot of the time and left arm leg spin, and it, it didn't always come out right. But when it did, and he would do all his homework. And if he felt that he'd done something, you know, he'd made a mistake, certainly when he was batting, and I'm not lying here, I'm a Stanley. No. He would go to the dressing room and he would literally smash his bat all over the floor. Yeah. He'd have to leave the dressing room. If you knew that he'd dropped a ball out, you know, and his own fault, he hadn't. It, they hadn't got him out. He would come in. He went through so many bats. It was untrue. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, he, he, he used to lose his rank, yeah. Yeah, and that wasn't just because he was, you know, trying to impress us. That's because he cared, and he, you know, he wanted us to improve, and he wanted the club to improve. So yeah, there were good times for good players. But you know, I mean, we, we, we beat we, with Flags as pro. We beat Bakel, you know, at Bakel with, yeah. uh, and yeah. uh, we, we we kept him to a low score. It was actually the game. Well, I got our break at Bake Up, and but they, they got a reasonable score. I mean, when he bowled, when Roger Harper bowled, if you'd 130 on board, you'd a chance. And Flegg's just kept running down wicket at him, but never once played an attacking shot. Just kept yeah. running down wicket to him and hitting him for one. You know, knew he couldn't sort of knew he couldn't get stumped and just used his feet. It was sort of a little bit. I'd never seen anything like it. You know, playing at lower house at that point, just like out to play him, and he just he just milked him and finished sixteen or out, and we won. I think we won with two wickets down, something like that, against Roger Harper. You know, get get, get some stick to stand, but uh, I mean, I was a bit of an ally stand at times, and uh, obviously because of where we feel, you, right, if he were at third man, I'd be at fine leg. Like, Long on, long off, and we had this little sub console. We had this little game where we used to like make each other laugh. You know, we used to try and make each other giggle or laugh. And uh, you know, if someone hit a tower in six, and we're at long on, long off. One of us had shaped mine. You know, think you know things like that. And and I mean, probably undermining him a bit, but he used to it, him and Gary didn't quite see how to. And he used to wind Gary. He used to go down to third man with fielding helmet on. And if Gary shouted at him, he'd say, "I'm, I'm saving his five runs, Skip. I'm, you know, I'm just doing it to save five runs." And, you know, and it used to make me laugh, but sometimes you weren't supposed to be laughing, you know what I mean? Honestly, can you imagine his reaction now if someone did that in a pristine game or or any or a game at any level? It's so apoplectic. I was just yeah. a gooch and I remember Stanley and uh, and Stan the jokes and Gary had split him up almost it to be a case yeah. of moving him around the field. And it wasn't as if Brock used to be on it as well. We used to try and make each other giggle, you know, but yeah, and I was on Gary's side in trying to get it a little bit more, you know, professional. And then Stan would encourage. You imagine Stan it and Prop didn't need a lot of encouraging. <laughs> when Stan had a bit of a bee in his bonnet about something, it would start making the others laugh. And it wasn't as if because to, I'm not. I don't think I'm talking out of school here, Stan. Uh, but between you and Stan, there'd be the other occasion where the ball would trickle down to third man or long leg and would find its way in the boundary. Welcome to Stories with Stan. Once again, we assembled at Alexandra Meadows, and once again, with the exception of Chris Scott and myself, the rest of the team turned up dressed like the survivors of a nuclear holocaust. So at least the skipper was dressing smartly in his D-mob suit. The skipper on this occasion was the veteran-looking Chris Scott. Our regular skipper was working either for the police or on his denim farm. Chris took his role seriously as one might expect, he instructed everyone that we had to refer to him as Skipper and that any references to him as Baldy, as usually happens, will be dealt with by the committee. He started off well, defending his 100% record of victories as standing Skipper. He decided that he needed experience near him in the slips rather than the usual belching and grunting from Matt Holt. Matt dropped down to third man 
and I came into the slips as the senior man. I've always been conscious as a former captain of being too willing to give advice, and so in an attempt to avoid pestering the skipper, I bit my tongue for the first time. Just as well, really, because as my first foray into the world of suggestion, I simply said to him, Chris, could I just suggest something? He turned round and said, shut your mouth, fuck off, go down to third man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not happy with this, as you can imagine. I approached him after the end of the over and said, what was all that about? He completely ignored me, repeated his, his message of how to leave, and off I went to third man to speak to a number of spectators for the rest of the game. So, Stanny, you played 138 games in the... Sorry, 134 games in the first team. And then you moved on to a new role of um, second team captain. If you just want to briefly explain how that came about, and then well, I mean, the, the club at the time there were a bit of, there were there were issues away from cricket, where, and people were leaving for certain reasons, you know, and there, there were a bit of a fallout. Me personally, Stan and I think Stan and Jez asked me to go down to the club one Saturday morning, so I went from work, and they said the situation is this, and we didn't actually. At the time, if Jez remembers right, we didn't actually have anybody who wanted to be first team captain, let alone second team captain. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And they, they, were, they were honest with me that, you know, they said you, you, would, you, could, you could have been the first team captain, but obviously things hadn't, hadn't gone as I'd wanted them to with my bowling. You know, I'd, 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 I'd trouble with my action and things like that. And uh, I just were nowhere near nowhere near the player or whether a few aborted attempts at comebacks you know you know Matt tried to persevere with me for a few games you know a bit had gone you know it completely gone and I, and I brought my wrist I brought my wrist at wrist and in one of aborted comebacks oh, yeah. and things I like remember that game so, so, it, so it, it just weren't there anymore so they needed a second team captain so Stan said how do you feel about doing that so I said let's give it a go it, it weren't something I really thought of at that time you know as a, it, it was a funny time for me because I didn't, I, didn't, I weren't thinking. Well, I thought there's no chance we're going to get back in first team because I can't. It's just, I, it's just not there. And I played in seconds. I, I, I can't remember who the captain to be honest. I played in seconds for most of two. It might have been Pete Gainer, and uh, I, I got away with my batting. Funnily enough, in second team, you know, I was getting a couple of thirties, a couple of four. So I mean, you'd have probably been playing in second team then, Joe. You know, when I when I came when I started playing in two thousand, but I weren't, I weren't doing a great deal of bowling even in second team. But then they suggested this captaincy thing. I said, you give it your honour. And it, it was hard work because we didn't have any players. You know, I mean, first team was struggling for players. So, what, you know, what was the second team going to be like? I mean, you were turning up and there were people you didn't know. And, you know, with the West Indian guy, Greg Brown, who turned round, turned round, swung at a ball so hard, he turned round and hit wicket keeper on Ed against Ramsbottom. <laughs> Like, that, yeah. that's the levels that's the levels we dropped to you know that was the, the sort of player we were attracting so I'll be honest with you it weren't much fun captaining at that point then I, then I, I probably captained 2002 then I left halfway through through 2003 for, for personal reasons and I didn't play again actually till 2006 Frank Ente I think Frank Ente he was either retiring or He'd, I think they needed him in the night at first team. So Frank said, well, I'll step down at second team captain. So I just rang Stan up. Uh, I'd, I'd settled down with Sharon then at this point. I rang Stan up. I said, I'll give it another go if you want, Stan. We did. And, uh, you know, Stan said, yeah, let's go for it. So I went from not playing at all to captain at second team again in 2006. And that weren't as bad because with a few young players coming through then, and the 2017 sort of Paddy, Joe Hawk, you know, and we were finished Phil Edmondson. You know, Swift, they never let you down in second team. You know, Matthew and, and people like that. So, we were a decent we were a decent side in 2007. Obviously, Ben Ben was sort of as one of his better, probably his best batter then. And it was a good team. You mentioned your, bro- you mentioned your brother there. How did you um, how did you get on captaining your brother? We had a few. Uh, we had words at times, you know. It's, it's hard work. It, 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 we're hard work. It, we're hard work captaining Matthew because they know... I mean, Jez should know more than anyone. He's captained both his brothers and they've captained him. And I don't, I don't know. I, it's hard to say because I had to drop him off at time because he was useless. <laughs> <laughs> it 
He's MD now, though, Stan. He? He, he is. is, is, is he um, might veto this podcast if he's playing him off too much, although he does seem to get down. mentioned every single week. <laughs> so, um, so, Paul, as you mentioned, you... Uh, 2006, 2007, you, we started to get a lot of players off Stan's production line coming through and started to get some good teams. As you said, you finished second. I think there was a cup semi-final in there as well. There were a few uh, cup semi-finals, yeah. We did that a few times, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what was you, should always, you should always mention that. I mean, I mentioned some of the players there, but right through that, I mean, good mate of mine, but good mate of mine now, but Aggers, Aggers was sort of consistent in that team through that period, and he was consistent as well. Probably by his own admission, not quite good enough for the first team. But he'd always get you four or five scores a season with Aggers, you know, and it, it, it would. So, like I say, when I come back to 2006, I was a lot better team. And uh, the 2008, 2009, I think, I think a second team captain, I mean, we had the runners-up seasons, but the, this, the, the season I enjoyed the most was actually my last, I think. When we had, when we had yourself, Johnny Whitehead, um, Fergus, Matt Walker, you know, and, and all, all you all you guys were coming through and we were playing and, you know, you, you could see you were all going to be really good players. We're, we're, you know, we're turning up. We, I mean, you were all, you were all proper kids then, most yeah. of you. you know, proper, but we're, just t- we're turning up and hammering teams, you know, and basically with a team of under-15s, I think we finished about fourth in league. Mm. Yeah. You know, we were like me and a team of under fifteens, but but we were playing proper cricket and hammering teams, and you know that were good fun. You know, Jack Edgar were playing at thirteen, and you know getting thirties and forties, and really really good. That were a good time. That, but I just, I just couldn't. And I just played in that team. Yeah, you just couldn't. Uh, I just couldn't carry on. Me 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 um, me heel, me, me left heel were just absolutely shot at and. No, I just couldn't, you know, I, I, all I was doing, my captain, and I, was, I, I sort of felt I was taking a place up, really. You know, I, 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 I couldn't even bat in seconds then. I couldn't bowl, and, you know, I think I bowled away twice all season, if that. So it, it, it just it just got a bit too much. And what actually finished, what actually did finish it for me was, um, captain in seconds, was we played at Colne, one of the games I had to bowl. And, yeah, I uh, remember. I bowled, about four, I bowled about 14 overs, and I couldn't get out of bed the day after. I mean, I mean that, that much agony with me, my left heel, so... Well, that game, that really Stanley, uh, that game, Con got 250, yeah. all out of 42 overs. <laughs> yeah, we did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you had to bowl. But I'm glad you mentioned that season, Stanley, because the first game, the first game we played, I'd played three or four games the previous year. But that first game that we played, we'd, we'd, practiced, in the, we'd practiced in the nets before, before we started and we'd had a, a, a team talk. And we were playing Bay Cup. Now, Bay Cup had Chappie playing and Terry Lord and yeah. uh, Peter Felson were playing. Yeah, we murdered him. Yeah. And, and we properly battered them. We yeah. properly... I mean, I managed to get 95 that day. Um, I wonder why but, you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> but there were some amazing performances that year. Johnny got a... Johnny, I'm sure Johnny got a century and Ferg Bailey got a century as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that game against Bay Cup, Aggers, um, Aggers were run out for ball. They did. Uh, you were running <laughs> with me. Call for started, a, that's, call that's for a three. <laughs> That started off my superstition, that, and not watching not watching the game until uh, we scored a run. Yeah. yeah. Eight, one, three, mid-wicket. Three! So, look, I think it's, it's only a short boundary, that, I guess. It must, it must have been short by about ten yards. Did, did he shout three when he hit it? No, he two. Might, he, he, he might he have... Two. I can't remember. Say, that's he got, that's he got village. The mate village. What, what, what happened was I was stood in the dressing room and Aggers hit it through mid-wicket and I said... There we are, we're away for the season. And no sooner had the words left me, if I just turned round and got the night by half a pitch. <laughs> and from that moment on, I had a superstition, which actually served as well, where I didn't watch, I didn't watch as bad until we'd scored a run. And that, until we scored a run and not lost a wicket. So, but, that, but that team was the making of the next period of success um, yeah. in the next well, sort of 10 well, years. I'm- I'll just give you a few names from from second eleven that for that year uh, that you didn't mention: Fergus, Matt Walker, Matt Marquis, very very useful cricket yeah. at that level. Yeah. Mickey Lee he used Mickey to get a lot Lee. of second team wickets, didn't Mickey, he? Mickey yeah. Lee, Mickey Lee took a sixer in the first game, and I think in the ho- first half of the season he took thirty odd wickets, maybe yeah. maybe more. And I think he ended with forty odd wickets. Absolutely brilliant. Scott Hope, Matt Doughty, good players. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Um, yeah, we're good team. Thanks for that, Sunny. Uh, I think that's a really good place to finish, actually, because then you start. Oh, no, oh, is it not? Oh, sorry. Carry, right, carry on then. What about him what, when he got? What about when he got Joe, picked? For... I know Joe wants, it, wants me to tell a tale here, don't you, Joe? Oh yeah. <laughs> what about when you um, you came back to play a couple of T Twenty games? Well, what do you like remember say, about that? Like I say, there were a couple of aborted attempts at comebacks. <laughs> And actually, 2007 went second team, finished runners up. I did bowl probably a bit more that season. We were short on a Friday night for a 2020 game. So Stan rang me up and said, Finch, you need someone someone to uh, go over to Tomadin and play for first team. How do you fancy it? I said, Well, I'll go, you know, no one else. <laughs> so I turns up and uh, we were batting and we got a good score. Now, just, just a bit of perspective here. My first ever wicket in Lancashire, as a Lancashire League first teamer with Phil Simmons. My last ever wicket as a Lancashire League first teamer was Faf de Plessis. What does he call him? De, 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 de Plessis. De Plessis. Yeah. So uh, my last ever it's wicket. Good that, Paul. It's good was that. Faf de Plessis. You know, there's not many people can have that on the CV. No, it's very good that, Paul. What happened in between? <laughs> not quite. Not quite as. And it, it sort of went something like this, really. I bowled at de, de Plessis. And he hit me for two. And the next ball, he skied one to mid-off and Finchy caught it, but he crossed. We were back and we had a guy called Simon Newbit. So Newbit's facing. First ball, I bowled at Newbit. He has a wild slash at it and he hits it towards point, right down Scott Hope's throat. And I mean right down. Scott's at least two yards off boundary edge. All of a sudden, I'm thinking I've got two wickets in two balls here. Next thing, it's gone for six. <laughs> And I can't, I can't, you can't work out what, I still to this day cannot work out what Scott did. So third ball, a ball's again. He hits that for six, that were a bit, bit of a clean of it. That landed in bandstand at Centreville Park. <laughs> so with four balls in, a ball's the fifth ball at him. Now, one of my best friends in the world, possibly celebrated as one of the greatest fielders the club's ever had. Just to his left, so it's a definite single. Charlie Cotton completely misses it. So they come back for a second. So Nubit's still on strike. The last ball of the over, he has an almighty swing. And it, it flies off to the leg side. And it's going right down Phil Edmondson's throat. Phil Edmondson were playing that night. And Phil Edmondson did exactly the same as Scott Hope. I thought he's caught it. It's gone for six. And, and Phil Edmondson dropped it for six. So it's, it's same over. I had two catches dropped for six, been smashed for six, and got faffed the police out. <laughs> So I thought, well, Finch is going to take me off now. So we're that. Right. <laughs> That's fair my work done for the evening. Yeah, fair play to Fincher. He came up to me and he says, "Look, he said, no, you've been it for three sixes, but you you should have had him eight twice there. How do you, how do you fancy it? Do you have another? I said, well, fair enough. It's up to you. So next, first ball at next over, he absolutely skies it, and I mean, it would orbit, but it's going to Ben Eat. I thought, give us a chance here now. But it went that high, they ran three. But Ben but Ben dropped it. So now we've we're one for twenty-five off seven balls. The fourth ball of the over. Uh, sorry, the second ball of the over. This is this is absolutely true. A ball at the other batter. And it hit him on the pad and went past Jack McGregor. It were a definite two. All of a sudden, Jack McGregor tears after it, keeps it at one, so Nubit's back on strike. And I'm thinking to myself, is he, is he fucking mad? Why is he <laughs> throwing up two? As I look round, Mick Bibby signalled it as a wide. <laughs> so so there's, still five, there's still five balls left. The next four, he hit me for three sixes and a four. But... My last ever ball as a first team cricketer with a dot ball. <laughs> and I finished I finished with one for forty nine of two overs with three drop catches. But then, and nobody knows this, on the Saturday we played Asland in its second team and a great player, I was thought, I thought it was a real class act, a guy called Stuart Taylor playing for Asland in seconds. And I was talking to him before the game, Stuart Taylor, and he says I'm he said I'm absolutely knackered standing. He said I shouldn't be playing. He said I'm I'm injured. He said, but uh, I should really be sitting out. He said, I'll, I'll have a bat, I'll do what I can. So that day, first ball, a ball at Stuart Taylor. He edged it, Paddy Howley dropped it. Second ball with a dot ball. The third ball, he hit it up in air. It landed 
Paddy and Max Owls watched it land between the cells, just stood and watched it land there. And what Ant said is Stan had put the wicket about 50, we were playing an under 13 wicket near Grangeman's Hut. And Stuart Taylor hit the next three balls for six. So in three overs, I've been hit for nine sixes, I had five catches dropped, and got South African's future captain out in three overs. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. I think that just uh, snapshots yeah. your snapshots your career nicely. That doesn't it? Paul? Yeah, and that's you know that that's when that's when my first team career ended that day. It struggled. Oh, although I subfielded against Bakeup and they ran a four to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic, Excellent. Stanny! Very good. Very. Oh, good. really good. Now I think that's a good place. <laughs> good place to end. <laughs> we'll get you on again, Stanny, to discuss. Um, your next role, which was first team manager and all the success in those eight years or however long it was. I can't remember now that we won that much. Hopefully, we can, uh, hopefully we'll get you on again. Thank you for coming on. Uh, just a no mention problem. as well to our Housecast sponsor, Johnny Russell uh, from the Art Caterers and Milltown Pies, who sponsors the podcast. We really appreciate his support. So you can get all your pies and everything else from him. You can find him on um, Facebook and, 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 and Twitter. Um, so thank you very much uh, and thank you for listening again.